So, I'm going to be talking about a model of lifetime and ownership, and uh, introducing a smart pointer class that can be used with it. it uh, so, lifetime is bounded by the usage of data. It's a lower bound. It's a, uh, it's a tight lower bound. So, if you check out this diagram, consider this red box as a resource and it's allocated at the beginning of the main function, and then it's passed around, and then there's a thread forked, and then the thread is joined. The green box represents the uh, lower bound of all of the usages of the data. So this is the earliest point at which you can free it. So uh, the, uh, the question is, how do we free data as early as possible, but no earlier? Let's take a look at std unique pointer. This deletes data as soon as the destructor runs, but it can't be passed as such to functions in general. And let's see why. Let's say you have a function foo that takes a resource, and you have that resource encapsulated in a unique pointer. And let's say you want to call foo twice. Well, you can't std move it the first time, and that's really the only way to transfer the unique pointer, so you have to dereference it. And as you can see here, we have two definitions of foo, not one, which is pretty inconvenient. So, then there's, I mean, if you only want one definition of foo, then you can do it this way, but the trade-off here is that since we're not moving the ownership into foo, which is the last usage of the data, we have to wait until it's returned before we can free it. So we can't free it immediately after its last use. And shared pointer is similar. It, uh, we, uh, with shared pointer, you only have to define foo once, and you can delete the data as soon as it's been used last, but you're incrementing an atomic reference count. And so that's a little bit slower. So unique pointer is a little more um, fast, but then shared pointer is a little uh, um, more uh, memory efficient or resource efficient. So here is the introduction of this putter class. Um, it has an owned object and a bool strong value. So there is uh, no atomic ref count at all, no ref count, just a... Um, Boolean, and uh, it deletes the owned object if it's strong, otherwise it doesn't. So here's the struct definition. We've got our data pointer and a strong, which is set to true by default when you construct one of these. The copy semantics are when you copy a uh, putter, you copy the data pointer and the copy is always weak. So it never deletes the owned object. Uh, when you move it, it uh, copies the data putter pointer and it copies the strong value and so if you copy a strong pointer, you get a strong pointer. If you copy a weak pointer, you get a weak pointer. But then the original is always set to weak. So you move the ownership, you transfer the ownership. So here's what our unique pointer and shared pointer example looks like with putter. It's the exact same as shared putter, except when you copy it, there's no atomic ref count that is incremented or decremented. And uh, one thing that I want you to notice here is that ownership is decided locally. So you can have absolute tunnel vision you can just look at this block of code and say, hey, that parameter or that argument is the last usage of x, so I'm gonna std move it. And uh, similarly, if the last usage is a dereference, then you can set it to the default object to get rid of it after you've used it last. And this is all tunnel vision, completely local. And uh, so I wrote a test program. This is the unique pointer uh, version of it. This is the shared pointer version of it. And this is the putter version of it. The unique pointer passes a ref into our function. It creates a call stack 100 high and does it uh, 100,000 times. And these are the data. Um, unique pointer is much faster. Putter is a little faster than shared pointer. But uh, I'm going to pause you there. Thank you. Thank you. And rather awkwardly switch back to the app. Oh, where's it gone? Here we go. Now I want to hear what you think. Go. That looks good to me. So I think we're going to get another four minutes for Jefferson. Thank you. So I'll switch this back and put you back up here. Wonderful. Okay, thanks. We're good. All right. It's not moving, should I? Okay. So the takeaway from this is just that ownership is decided locally and that it's bounded by the usages of data. And that's a tight lower bound on when you can free things. So now let's implement some uh, 
functors in C++, abstracting away control flow. First, I would like to define polymorphism just real quick. Um, it is when an identifier can have a different meaning depending on the context or environment that it's in. And there are two kinds of polymorphism that I'm going to go over, ad hoc polymorphism and parametric. Now, uh, ad hoc polymorphism is when an identifier refers to different source code depending on its context. And that is in C++ as function overloads. So two string here, you have a double overload and an int overload, and they will have different function bodies. So that's ad hoc polymorphism. Parametric polymorphism is uh, when you have the same source code up to a substitution. So in template uh, type name t vector, the source code of vector is the same for all t up to a substitution. But as we all know, there's vector bool. Um, templates are not exactly parametric polymorphism. There's a uh, uh, degree of variation here. So if there are no specializations at all, then it's parametric. And if it's only specializations, then it's ad hoc because you have different code for each type. So type classes, these are a Haskell language feature that provide ad hoc polymorphism for the language, and they're much like C++ concepts. A type class is a contract that a data type can meet by introducing overloads of functions. Functor is a pretty simple type class and a good example for C++. So a functor is a type class that any parametrically polymorphic type can meet, such as vector or optional. And uh, a type can be a functor if it can be mapped over. So the requirement is that there is a function that is called fmap. So std vector is a, a functor if you use a for loop to map over it, and uh, std optional is a functor if you use an if statement to check if it's null or not before uh, mapping over the contained value. And there's one more rule. When you fmap over a functor with the identity function, you have to get back the original object or something that's equal to it. So you're not allowed to play dirty tricks like uh, fmap of any optional is the empty optional. That's not allowed. So that's the, up above is the Haskell type signature of fmap, and then below is a C++ one. And uh, here are some implementations. If you ignore all the noise, you can see that the fmap for the vector has a for loop inside of it, and the fmap for optional has an if statement inside of it. So we're beginning to abstract away control flow by using this kind of thing. So a C++ implementation begins very simply. You create a uh, struct with nothing in it. It's gonna be purely ad hoc polymorphism. The braces might even be optional. I didn't check. Um, so the to implement functor for vector, you just overload that struct, uh, or I mean specialize it, and uh, give it a static method that uses a for loop and then for the optional, again, you specialize it, and this static method has a, um, an if statement. And uh, I, I seem to have forgotten to include the slide on the free function fmap, but basically it, uh, it, it instantiates functor impl for the right functor and then uh, calls that static method. But here's an example of how you can use it. You have this uh, request thing that could be an error, but then like, let's say you want to do some processing on it and do a few things that could raise errors and then handle them all at the end. Um, functor can be used for that sort of thing and other type classes as well. 